In this video, we're going to be talking about polynomial inequalities. So those are inequalities of the form a, where a is a constant multiplied by x plus a1, multiplied by x plus a2, perhaps all the way to x plus a n is greater than 0 or less than 0. And because these inequalities are quite nice, there are general ways of solving them. So for example, take the inequality x multiplied by x plus 2 to the power 6 is larger than x. First of all, this inequality doesn't really look like uh, the form I mentioned at the beginning of the video, so let's put it in that form. We'll do that by subtracting both sides of this inequality by x. So we get x multiplied by x plus 2 to the power 6 minus x is greater than 0. And we can immediately factorize an x from the left-hand side of this inequality. We get x multiplied by x plus 2 to the power 6 minus 1 is larger than 0. Now the first thing you want to do when you have a polynomial in this form is you want to draw a number line, or at least visualize a number line of some kind. And on this number line you just want to put the roots of the polynomial um, you're solving the inequality for on the number line. So you're going to put all, these polynomial, all the roots of this polynomial onto this number line. Now, x equals 0 is clearly a root of the polynomial. We also have roots when uh, this stuff, this expression here, is equal to 0. Uh, that happens when x is equal to negative 1 and when x is equal to negative 3. So these are the roots of this polynomial. And because we've done this, we've actually partitioned the number line into some segments. Uh, these are those segments. So algebraically, I'll just write down what these segments mean. This segment here means x is larger or equal to 0, less than positive infinity. The black dot just means or equal to. This segment here is x is less than uh, 0, larger or equal to negative 1. This segment here is x is less than negative 1, greater than negative 3. And this segment here is x is less than or equal to negative 3, greater than negative infinity. So as you can see, we've partitioned the number line into four different pieces. Let's say this is uh, piece one, this is piece two, piece three, and piece four. And basically what we're going to do in order to solve this inequality is we're just going to check every piece. So on checking piece one, we immediately see that when x is equal to zero, the polynomial itself is zero. That's because x is a root of the polynomial. However, when x is larger than 0, we know that x plus 2 to the power 6 minus 1 is certainly also larger than 0, and so the polynomial is always positive. In other words, x is larger than 0 is a solution. So we've checked piece 1. Now let's check piece 2. So piece 2 says that x is less than 0 greater or equal to negative 1. Now when x is equal to negative 1, the polynomial is again equal to 0. That's because this is a root of the polynomial. So let's check when x is larger than negative 1, negative one or less than 0. When x is larger than negative 1 or less than 0, then x plus 2 is less than 2, uh, greater than 1. So that x plus 2 to the power 6 minus 1 is less than 63 and is greater than 0. So we have x plus 2 to the power 6 minus 1 is positive and x is definitely negative. In other words, our polynomial, our polynomial is certainly negative. So this is not a solution. Let's check 3. In 3 we have x is greater than negative 1, less than negative 3, which means that, well, x is less than 0, it's certainly negative, and x plus 2 is less than 1, greater than negative 1. Now, all that means is that the absolute value of x plus 2 is definitely less than 1. Now, you can see why that's true. That's just because if x plus 2 has to be larger than negative 1, then it can be something like 
negative a half or negative a quarter. And if it's less than one, that can, then it can be something like a half or a quarter. But in any case, the absolute value of x plus 2 must be less than 1. Which means that, which means that x plus 2 to the power 6 minus 1, which is just equal to the absolute value of x plus 2 to the power 6 minus 1. Now, these are equivalent because 6 is an even number. So even if x plus 2 is negative, it's still going to return a positive output. So these two things are equivalent, x plus 2 to the power 6 and absolute value of x plus 2 to the power 6 are the same thing. Now we know that if x plus 2, if the absolute value of x plus 2 is less than 1, then the absolute value of x plus 2 to the power 6 minus 1, well let's see what that is, x plus 2 to the power 6 has to also be less than 1, in, in which case x absolute value of x plus 2 to the power 6 minus 1 has to be less than 0. In other words, x plus 2 to the power 6 minus 1 is negative and x is negative. This means our polynomial, our polynomial must be positive. So we have another solution. So x is less than 1, greater than negative 3 is a solution. Now moving on to the final fourth strip, I'm not even going to bother writing it down because this is quite easy to see, that when x is, first of all, when x is equal to negative 3, because negative 3 is a root of the polynomial, the entire polynomial is equal to 0, which means that it can't be greater than 0. Now if x is uh, less than negative 3, what that means is x is negative, but x plus 2 to the power 6 minus 1 is certainly not negative. x plus 2 to the power 6 minus 1 is always positive if x is less than negative 3. So you can check that, for, check that for yourself. So the fourth strip yields no solution, and the second strip yields no solution. So the solutions only lie in the first and the third segment, and they are x is larger than 0, so the solutions are x is larger than 0, and x is less than negative 1, greater than negative 3. Now, this method does work for any polynomial, given that you know all of its roots, but I haven't really told you why. And the reason why is basically because of something called uh, Rolle's theorem, or Rolle's theorem. And basically all it really says is that suppose we have a function on some interval. So let's say this interval is closed and it's a, b. If this is a closed interval and we have some nice continuous function uh, that's defined on this closed interval, and we also know that f of a is equal to f of b, so f of a is equal to f of b, and this is a nice continuous function, and it's differentiable, meaning you can differentiate it um, over any x value in this open interval, so you don't have to be able to differentiate it at these endpoints, but given you can differentiate it at any other value in this interval, then the function must attain, well, it must basically have a zero derivative at some point in that interval. And if it's a polynomial, so if it's a polynomial, or rather, if it's just any continuous function, then it's going to have a zero derivative at one of its extreme points. So what that means is it's going to have a zero derivative at a, uh, at a local maximum or a local minimum. Now, what is that? So how does this relate to the method I just described in solving polynomial inequalities? Well, it's simple really. What we did is, for that polynomial before, we pointed out all of its roots. So one of its roots was negative 1, and one of its roots was negative 3. Now notice that the polynomial is 0 over here, and is 0 over here. In other words, 
f of negative 3 is equal to f of negative 1. Now, polynomials are nice functions. They are continuous and differentiable. In other words, they satisfy all criterion for Rolle's theorem. In other words, a polynomial basically must have a zero derivative um, somewhere in this interval. And because polynomials are continuous functions, where they have zero derivatives, they attain local maximums or local minimums. In other words, we can either have this shape, or we can have this shape. Whoops. Or we can have uh, this shape between these zeros. So the, so the polynomial can either be strictly larger or equal to zero, or strictly less than or equal to zero in these pieces. But we still have to look at this piece over here, because we can also apply Rolle's theorem over here. And we still, Rolle's theorem says nothing about these regions, so we still have to check these regions, and we still have to check these regions. But that's essentially why the method I just described works for polynomials. Thank you for watching.